If there's ever a moment when the Beatles were being professional songsmiths, it's the Help album. Now in retrospect, John Lennon always used to say that the song Help was his great cry from the heart. And I was screaming out for help but nobody could hear me. But I think that was something he, uh, that was a, a, an inference he added to the song later. I don't think anybody, I'm sure the rest of the members of the band didn't realise that in 65. Help was, was the end of a chapter of the Beatles' career. It was like, although probably unknowing to them, had closed the chapter on the first part of their career. Help came at the end of pretty much two years of solid touring for the Beatles, and uh, as the title would suggest, John Lennon was quite keen that the, uh, somebody stopped the merry-go-round and let him off. They've had this success for a few years, and I think a lot of it was getting to them. They couldn't go anywhere without being seen and bothered and disturbed. So I think it was a true cry for help, and I think a lot of the innocence of the band and the music was coming to an end at that stage of their career. Help, I think, definitely was an album that was the last album where you had rockers like um, Dizzy Miss Lizzie. They had more years of experience as songwriters behind them. They had a bit more time now to experiment more in the studio. They became quite powerful within the record company because they were selling lots of records and they could do a little bit more of what they wanted to do. And consequently, what they'd been up to in their private life was then coming out in the making of the record. Now the Help album has also got Yesterday on, which is the most covered song in history still, I think, and probably will be forever. Um, an immaculate piece of songwriting. Um, I have no idea where it came from. Paul McCartney has no idea where it came from. Various people have tried to find the melody in old songs by Nat King Cole or old bits of classical music. But as far as Paul was concerned, he just woke up one morning and had that tune. And he spent about 18 months then going around to everybody he met saying, have you heard this tune before? It must be somebody else's. And they'd go, no. Oh, okay. And then he ended up with the song. Well, Yesterday is certainly one of the most, uh, if not the most, celebrated of all the Beatles songs. Well, I think that was kind of a, uh, a kind of crucial moment in the, the Beatles' career, really, where people realised that they were not just the four mop tops, they really were masterful songwriters. And of course it attracted a whole other area of audience, a, a lot of other people who might not have listened to a Beatles record, suddenly thought, oh, that's nice, that's different. Even though it, it can be considered sort of a middle-of-the-road song, it was covered by so many different people, you know, it really was a hallmark song for the Beatles because they were a rock and roll band, and here was a rock and roll song using a string quartet in it. The reason everyone fawned over yesterday is because it's the first time they used strings. Simple. It's the first time an orchestra started on, and they started to expand their musical ideas, and that's why everyone goes for it. Ah, oh, the Beatles have written a ballad. Basically, that's because people haven't listened to the other albums because there's a few in there. But the rest of the Help album was very much sort of Beatles by numbers. They were, by this point, they knew how to write a, a Beatles pop song and they could do it in their sleep. And most of Help sounds as if they did do it in their sleep. I think this was a groundbreaking album in a lot of ways because uh, this is when I would say more or less all ties were severed with the Mersey sound. Rubber Soul, the second Beatles fully written album. By the time Rubber Soul came around most of their recording sessions would start at like 9 or 10 o'clock at night and go to 4 or 5 in the morning. Um, this was basically because of their lifestyle and the fact that they had a bit more carte blanche to do a lot more different things in Abbey Road. More than ever before they started um, recording their music uh, just using single tracks rather than playing so much live in the studio as, as they did when they first started out. George Martin, great musician, started to help them arrange, started to put strings, started to put brass on things, started to help them. He would say, well, chaps, you know, we've got a, an oboe makes an interesting sound there or a, a flugelhorn or, you know, and they'd say, well, let's hear it, George, can we get it? And he would get the, the, the classical musicians in to play it, and they'd say, that's great. You know. So here was a very different approach to recording. They didn't see any reason for changing keys at the wrong time. They didn't see any reason for not doing this. They just saw no reason for not doing anything like that. So when it came to 
to Rubber Soul, they kicked in big time. That was the first of five classic records to be made. Once the Beatles knew that they'd got the public ear and that they didn't have to fight to be heard, the music became more interesting and the songs became more interesting. Perhaps it was the lyrics that really became more interesting because Lennon and McCartney started putting their own problems into song. You, you see the Beatles not trying to write a, a love song or trying to write something for a specific group. They really wanted to broaden their scope and to write songs that were either based on life experiences or on how the way they felt about things. There was a period of time, I can't think how long it was, but it was some time in between the previous album to Rubber Soul and the start of Rubber Soul. What had happened in that time, I don't know. They had changed so much so that when, you see, up to the previous album before Rubber Soul, we were like a, a happy family, the, 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 the six of us. It was that tight. It was uh, so enjoyable up to that time, everything. I mean, George Martin used to call himself the fifth Beatle. Well, I, I argued with him on that when I did interviews. He wasn't. He, he said I was the sixth, but I used to reverse it. I was the fifth, he was the sixth. Anyhow, that's the sort of relationship we had. It was lovely, you know. Up until they came in and started Rubber Soul, and I noticed a distinct change, which I did not like one little bit. Personality change, particularly between Paul and John. And I didn't, they looked different in any case. Uh, I think they were their beards and whatever. And they looked completely different and they acted so different. And the, the nice family life had gone. And now it was this, well, I didn't like it. They were bickering, they were taking much longer to do tracks, uh, arguing about what they should do. There was that distinctive, I wouldn't say dislike, but it was the start of dislike growing which upset me terribly. And uh, it was fortunately, I say fortunately, because I was able, if I wished, to get out of it. Simply because the offer of becoming a producer came about soon after we started uh, Rubber Soul. And I thought to myself, what good timing for, for me now to get out, because I don't like what's going on. So I said to Epstein and George Martin, I can't stand this, this you know. Uh, you know I've got the offer of, of uh, taking over the parlor thing, uh, become a producer myself. So I went out. So of course, I mean, that caused great disappointment and upset amongst the boys. And uh, they, they, well, what they did to soften me up, I suppose, I don't know, they were that upset. They went out to Asprey's in New Bond Street and they bought me a gold clock, a, a carriage clock, inscribed it to me from them i still got it, of course, all locked away, naturally. And, uh, and I thought, well, you know, they, 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 it, it, oh, it almost brought me to tears that they would do that, what they thought of me. Would I please continue and finish the album, uh, Rubber Soul, which I agreed to do. And, uh, but after that, I said, you know, that I can't continue anymore because simply I've got now to get on with my new job as producer. So, uh, it was a mixture really for me in terms of you, of enjoyment. Uh, enjoyment of the sounds that I produced, yes, uh, uh, in Rubber Soul, uh, quite impressive, but um, disappointment and upset in terms of the relationships. And I could s foresee, quite honestly, it was the beginning of the breakup, of the end of the group. Well, the Bunters were in Abbey Road Studios recording My Brother Makes the Noises for the Talkies, and, uh, which is a very, very silly song. And um, I, you know, it required obviously a lot of sound effects. And while the guys were figuring out what a razor scraping noise would be or uh, a steam scraping, I went down the corridor to the gents, you know, and it was on my way back. And the layout of the building is such that you come back up the main corridor and you're facing the front door. And there in the front door, you know, silhouetted from the sunlight outside, were, were four guys with very distinctive haircuts and pointy shoes and dark glasses and, you know, two big minders. And I, I thought, of course, it's them. <laughs> you know, it's the fabs. And uh, so I, I did. I snuck out the corridor later on uh, to see...
what they were up to. In fact, they were they were working one on one of George's songs, and it was funny because I was telling him about this, you know, years later, and and he immediately remembered the riff, you know, this wonderful riff. exciting things I'd heard at the time. You know, it's quite bizarre because then I had to go back into our studio and finish off, my brother makes the noise as well, the dog is. And uh, <laughs> a wide range of music available there in 1966. Up until 1966, every time George Harrison came up with a song, everybody laughed at him. Particularly George Martin, the Beatles producer, who would always sort of pat him on the back, patronizingly, and say, well, it's not bad, but go away and do something better. And I, th I think John and Paul were also very, very cynical about um, their, their younger brother as they would have seen him because don't forget he's three years younger than John Lennon. Um, very cynical about the idea that he suddenly wanted to be a songwriter as well. Um, in fact, in, in 65, he had already started to write interesting, unusual songs, and he had a very sort of cynical, open-eyed, open realistic take on romance as well. And that came through in 66 with the, the three great songs he wrote for a Revolver, uh, where he, he really um, started to exert his influence on the band. Now, the most important way in which he changed the Beatles' um, songwriting was by introducing the in Indian influence. Not quite the first time it had been done on a pop record. The Yardbirds and maybe the Kinks had got there first. But as far as the outside world was concerned, he was the one who was leading the world into sort of Oriental mysticism and uh, the whole sound of the sitar and the tabla and so on. And in '66, for for something like "Love You Too," George Harrison's Indian song to turn up on the Revolver album. I think it opened people's eyes amazingly, and I think people couldn't really believe what they were hearing. I think George was um, very underestimated and had tremendous talent, and unfortunately, because John and Paul, historically, I think you've got to put this into context. John had started the band. Paul had joined the band later, but became very much an integral part of it. And George, it mightn't seem a lot, but I think when you are 19, 20, and somebody's only 16, they're the little kid. And George had joined the band, even, even younger than that, when he was about 14 years of age, and John was very reluctant to take him on because of his age. And I think, in John and Paul's eyes, he was always seen as the little kid. Now, consequently, he used to, he didn't have the greatest singing voice, George, but he could write material and was a very, very talented man, but he would only get the statutory sort of obligatory two tracks if he was lucky on an album. Now, the interesting thing is that when the Beatles disbanded, George really, I think, came into his own, really came into his own with his own work, uh, right through to the end of his life, you know, the stuff he was doing. But when he was with the Beatles, I do think he was seen as sort of the young one. It's quite striking that the first song on Revolver is a George Harrison song, Tax Man. And OK, John, you always used to claim he wrote half of it and George should have given him the credit. But it is very much George. It's, um, it's about money. It's about worrying about what was going to happen to him as a person if all the money ran out. Because the Beatles were paying, I think it was 98% of their income at that point to the um, inland revenue. And so, not surprisingly, it was a very major preoccupation, particularly for George, who already had the reputation of being the one member of the Beatles who was interested in the business affairs. But for, for the youngest member of the band, and the one who had been treated as a joke, to suddenly have the lead track on the album was quite a breakthrough for George. Yellow Submarine was written by Paul. Um, it was all about a dream that he had had. And uh, the whole idea of it, uh, he, he, he always thought it was, you know, kind of a children's song. Again, it was written specifically for Ringo to sing it, and so the range, the vocal range is very narrow, and they would deliberately do that when they wrote for Ringo. George Martin helped out. He uh, had a, a closet he showed the Beatles full of all kinds of different weird instruments they could use, and they used tons of sound effects. It was just time for them to have a lot of fun in the studio. That was one of the joys of the Beatles, was that they could they could be uh, a group for all seasons and appeal to so many different, uh, you know, 
uh, social groups. It wasn't just a, a band producing clever music for the Times critics to mull over. They would come up with these daft little ditties now and then. And that was certainly a, a daft little ditty. <laughs> so if you look at the, the album as a whole, they take a number of different approaches and, and are opening wide the possibilities of what a popular song can take on in terms of subject matter. Yellow Submarine is simply one of those. It goes on an album that's packed with classics. I mean, Revolver, nearly the best album they ever made. Maybe the best album they ever made. Eleanor Rigby, Here, There and Everywhere, She Said, She Said, I'm Only Sleeping. I mean, that album has 14 classics on it. Do you uh, consider that now, uh, since you've been in the United States here for almost a week, that this religious issue is answered once and for all? Would you clarify so. and repeat uh, the answer that you gave you in Chicago? I can't yeah. repeat it again because I don't know what I said, you know. The most traumatic occasion, from my point of view, in the six years that I was with the Beatles as their PR, um, concerned, again, John and his outspoken interview with the London Evening Standard's Maureen Cleave, who, as part of a series of in-depth profiles of each of the Beatles for the Standard, um, spoke in-depth to John. And John, at one point in the conversation, talking generally about religion and social uh, circumstances of the era, uh, made the remark, the Beatles are more popular than Jesus now. He didn't say bigger. Uh, an awful lot of people have misquoted that of him saying in a boastful kind of a way, we're bigger than Jesus now. He didn't say that. He said we are more popular. And by this he meant that more people were going down to the local Empire theatres or the ABC cinemas um, to see concerts by the Beatles than were going to their local church or chapel or whatever to worship God, worship Jesus Christ. Uh, and it wasn't so much a boast at all as very valid social comment buried way down in the Evening Standard article. Um, it raised no eyebrows at all, uh, but I guess silent uh, nods of approval amongst the readership. Certainly it didn't startle me as the, the, the group's PR in any way. It didn't worry me greatly. And in fact, I've never talked about this before, but I can say that I was actually directly instrumental in helping to get that story reproduced in America, which became the cause of a massive furor where Beatles albums were burned. There was a threat um, that the whole of the, the tour that year of America would be called off because of the, the, the Ku Klux Klan and all kinds of threats, death threats were coming from, particularly from the religious zealots in the, the deep south, the, the southern states of, of America. And I was directly concerned in that, in that um, in the pre-tour months, when the Beatles were extremely busy and doing lots of other things, um, I was unable to get them as much as I would like to have got them um, for interview time with American journalists for American magazines. But I appreciated that the build-up in America was crucial to this massive tour that we were about to undertake. And when the publisher of Datebook magazine, a guy named Art Unger, when he came on to me and said was a chance he could do some interviews with the Beatles, I said, no, it's just going to be impossible at the moment, Art, uh, to meet your deadlines, but what I can do is put you on to Maureen Cleave at the London Evening Standard. She just did a series of superb, in-depth profiles of the Beatles, which I think would sit well in Datebook magazine. Uh, and he negotiated to get hold of that material. Well, would you clarify the you remarks read, that were attributed you know, to you? You tell me what you think I meant, and I'll tell you whether you, I agree or... Well, some know. of the remarks attributed to you in uh, some of the newspapers, the press here, uh, said that uh, concerning the remark that you made comparing the relative popularity of the Beatles with Jesus Christ and that yeah. the Beatles were more popular. This created quite a controversy and a furor in this country, <coughs> as you are obviously aware. Do you know that, John? You created it. Now, uh, would you uh, clarify the remark? Well, I've clarified it about 800 times, you know. I could have said TV or something else, you know, and that's as clear as it can be. I just okay. used Beatles because I know about them a bit more than TV. I could have said any number of things. I remember seeing John Lennon 
beforehand. It was my job to kind of prepare him for this very unusually serious press conference which we were holding on the eve of the tour in Chicago, at which the world's press would be represented, uh, and they were there for one purpose, not for a light-hearted show business style um, party come press conference at all, but a very serious um, interrogation type press conference where they would be all sort of saying, John, you've got to apologise, you've insulted uh, the church, etc. And um, I remember sitting in Brian Epstein's hotel suite with John, and John was saying, I will say whatever you tell me I should be saying, I'll, I'll say what I, I don't feel I have to apologise, should apologise. I've said nothing blasphemous or intentionally blasphemous, but I will say whatever you want me to say. And at one point during our conversation, John was sitting there most uncharacteristically um, with his head actually cupped it down in his hands and he was sobbing. He was weeping away, not at the um, prospect of the press conference itself, so much as the fact that he realised that if he didn't get it all right, that the tour might be cancelled, he might be letting down the group. This is one of the reasons, this is cited as one of the reasons why they stopped touring. Apart from the boredom of it as well, you know, they were cooked up in hotel rooms and, you know, they couldn't get out of theatres and walk around like they used to do, like the Paul McCartney as I knew walking down Matthew Street. That's it all gone. And John Lennon in particular didn't like the fact that you couldn't hear them. You know, all you could hear was this din of screaming. For a lot of people, Beatlemania was for life. I mean, even now in every major city across the globe, people have Beatle festivals regularly. And, you know, and the Beatles are acquiring new fans all the time with every successive generation. But I think that, that um, it was starting to ease up a bit by about 1965, 1966. For example, when they, when they toured the States, I mean, they, 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 it wasn't always guaranteed that, you know, one, that the stadium would be full anymore. There was very much an attitude of, you know, it was like London buses. If, if you miss one Beatle concert, there'd be another along if you waited long enough. Um, but at the same time, I mean, I think that touring was becoming almost, well, very definitely dangerous at the time. It was certainly very tedious for them. I saw the Beatles twice at Hammersmith Odeon on their Christmas shows. You couldn't hear anything. The noise was mental. The, the, the girls were wetting themselves. It was all getting silly. You've got to remember back in those days, guitar amplifiers were 30 watt. You didn't really have the amplification systems that you have now. You didn't even have the amplifications you would have at the end of the 60s. So really, when it came to playing live, the Beatles were always on to a loser. In a lot of cases, they had to just kind of wing it as to and hope that they were all playing together. When you listen to the old tape recordings of these uh, performances, uh, they did pretty darn good, you know, considering they couldn't hear themselves. It was an event, you know, musically maybe, they, they probably even couldn't even hear the Beatles. I mean, the Beatles couldn't even hear themselves play. So, I mean, it, you went there to be there kind of thing. I think that was the whole idea with the Beatles concerts at that time. So, you know, what are your criteria for a great live band? If the criterion is, well, somebody who can whip up a hell of a lot of enthusiasm, well, they didn't even have to play a note in order to do that. So yes, they were a great live band, but were they great musicians on stage? Um, possibly not. They were a very good band, but they were never given the chance to be a good band once they became really popular, because you could just hear nothing but screaming. I only saw them when, they were, when everyone was going mental and potty, and it was a great privilege to say I've seen the Beatles, but I didn't actually hear them. The Beatles played rock and roll very well and they also came out with all these extraordinary original songs which uh, didn't talk down to people. I think that's the important thing. That's why the Beatles um, struck a chord with so many people. Not just teenage girls screaming at John and Paul, but um, the whole uh, adult world as well loved the Beatles very quickly. I'm afraid I'm in the school that thinks that Sgt Pepper is one of the most overrated albums in rock history. Um, individual songs, I think, I think uh, some of them are wonderful. I mean, you can't fault a day in the life. Um, desperately trying to describe what I think of what the other really good songs are. I think the ones that have stood up best over 40 years 
and maybe the ones that people don't really remember, like um, the Paul McCartney songs, Fixing a Hole and It's Getting Better, which are very concise, tight bits of sort of pop rock songwriting. But the stuff that where they're self-consciously trying to do something new and you know, make a, a play or a movie or a musical out of it, with, um, with songs like Sar the Sgt. Pepper song itself, and also Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, I don't think they've dated you know, very well at all. They, they're very much of their time. I think that Sgt. Pepper um, was just a little bit self-indulgent, a bit over the top, a bit over, over waxed, over cooked. Um, no, I prefer my Beatles music much more raw than that, if you like. Uh, and so mainly I prefer the earliest stuff that they wrote. Although there was an amateurishness um, about it, Sergeant Pepper was too contrived uh, and it was natural that it should go that direction because after they came off the road, all eyes were upon this first product of their studio era um, and the Beatles were producing something not just for their thousands uh, millions of fans, but something I guess that they felt would be professionally strong enough to impress their own peers, i.e. the Rolling Stones, the Beach Boys, etc. One wonders what would have happened if they'd had the same kind of gear we've got now, you know. Because Sgt Pepper, I think, was recorded on four four-track machines. And it's because of them, you know, 24-track machines revolve, you know. When the Beatles started out, George Martin was the boss. He had a tie and he wore a suit and they did what he, what he told them to do. Very early on, he started to realise that there was actually some mileage in letting them you know, off the reins for a bit and let them indulge their ideas. But he would still very much be there to say, I don't think that's going to work, boys. By the time you get to Sergeant Pepper, I think that relationship has entirely changed and George Martin's role is not anymore to direct them, it's to enable them to carry out the ideas that they want and so they would come to him and say can we make a sound that sounds like monks chanting or an orchestra playing backwards and he would then settle, settle down and go right I think if we do this and we do that we can actually achieve it and the result was that then after that John and Paul would come in with even more outlandish ideas and poor George Martin would be forced to uh, and his staff would be forced to innovate and um, you know, at, that actually had quite a big influence on the, the development of the recording studio in the late 60s. The, the, the fact that the, the Beatles engineers were being forced to come up with unusual sounds to keep the group happy actually um, helped the engineers to create all sorts of innovations that are still being used today. Sergeant Pepper fated as the Beatles' true masterpiece. I put it down to one thing and one thing only. The Times gave it a great review. Stamp of approval. For me, bit of a smokescreen. If you're hip, then Sgt Pepper is not the greatest Beatles album, it's Revolver. If you're not, and I guess I'm not, then Sgt Pepper is the, is the sort of, I suppose, the pinnacle. It's not something that uh, the Beatles themselves had tried before, the mixture of different images, sounds, styles. It really does stand as a, a one of a kind. The packaging was unbelievably clever. You know, it came at you, it had the whole psychedelic swinging 60s thing about it, it just came at you, them in uniforms, the whole lot, it was just unbelievably perfect. You had the, the lyrics on the sleeve, you know, this is really the first signal that, hey, when you're listening to this stuff, you should listen to the lyrics, as well as just the, the, the groove and, and the melody. It was definitely a, a real departure. It, it sort of set the standard for other bands to try to uh, come up to the same standards as what the Beatles were doing at that time. And uh, it only came about because the Beatles, I believe, uh, had more free time on their hands and they weren't touring anymore. I thought that they hadn't really finished what they set out to do, which was to write one big piece of music. Um, I mean, it's full of marvellous things like you know, but they don't really link together. I think it was supposed to be uh, a concept album, but uh, I mean, when I'm 64 and a day in a life, don't really link um, thematically. As a concept record, which had never been made before, yes, it, it was brilliant. Um, Rubber Soul and Revolver, I think, in some ways, are probably stronger records, but if you say, what was their masterpiece? I would have to say it would be Sgt Pepper's because it also captured the era. It's a work of exploration and experimentation. It could have sort of fallen flat on its face. Commercially speaking, I think the world was shocked 
by the release of Sh Sgt. Peppers, but after, within months, I think the world loved Sgt. Peppers, and it was being hailed as a masterpiece way back then. Writing on the coattails of Sgt. Peppers' uh, album, um, it seemed the Beatles could do no wrong. The Beatles were very much affected by Brian Ep Epstein's death, and they really didn't want to be managed in full by anybody else. Um, as I say, they turned down one person in particular. Um, who can tell, really, what would have happened if he'd lived? Yeah, it wasn't until the Beatles physically stopped touring that there was any sort of breakdown in relations with Brian. It was just that it suddenly dawned that they didn't actually need a manager if their record contracts and all those things were already set up and done and they weren't going anywhere or doing anything so what was the manager and an agency going to do for them? I suppose the last job, gig, production, whatever uh, that I saw the Beatles do enthusiastically as a group, as a team together, working solidly together with mutual enthusiasm, must have been the making of Magical Mystery Tour um, towards the back end of 1967, immediately after Brian Epstein's death, in fact. Now, a lot of people at the time thought that Paul McCartney was being very callous in forcing the, the group to uh, go back to work within a few days of Brian Epstein's death and a few days of his funeral. But in fact, if, if Paul had not pushed them into working at that time, I believe that they might well have gone off to India with their newfound little giggling guru, the Maharishi, Mahesh Yogi, um, with whom they wanted to study transcendental meditation. George, in particular, had got the bug. The mystery tour was like a hangover after Brian had died, plus a hangover after Sergeant Pepper. And you know, those songs were, writ were nearly all written pre Sergeant Pepper and weren't used. I mean, your mother should know was a song Paul wrote as a possibility for all, with all you need is love for the satellite thing. And because all you need is love won the, the vote on that one. So he had that and George had his songs and John had written, I think Walrus was written during the, um, but not done during the Pepper sessions. And then Paul had this idea, let's go on a magical mystery tour. And they needed to do something to recover from Brian's disappearance. And they, the, 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 the thing with the NEMS people was just unbearable. There were all those uh, people who, who, instead of holding NEMS together as what it was, huge, big, all they were blathering about was who's going to manage the Beatles? You know, there's all of these agents and people and men in suits who worked there. They, uh, they couldn't, they never saw, within, within months, NEMS had just gone into nowhere, you know, the, Bee, the Bee Gees and Jimmy and the Who and the Cream and all those good people had all left because you know, it was... Uh, so the, the Beatles just wanted to get something, and particularly Paul wanted to get something done. So they just went off and did Magical Mystery Tour. There's another way that you can look at Magical Mystery Tour coming as it did in the immediate wake of Brian Epstein's death. It was a shattering experience for the Beatles because whilst on the one hand um, they had found him to be a much less effective, influential or necessary manager in the last years of his life, uh, they did value his friendship and remembered all the things that he had done for them. And all four Beatles were very, very upset indeed by his death. You can look at Magical Mystery Tour coming only a week or so after his death as being escapist. It was the Beatles' essential escape route, if you like, from the horrors of the fact that somebody so close to them as Brian Epstein, so young of their generation, in fact, um, had died in front of their eyes almost, as, as it were, like this. Um, you could see Magical Mystery Tour as, yeah, something where they were going to 
go into a, a magical world. Um, it, it, it was a world of magic and mystery, and it literally transported, it, it took them away in a bus down to the West Country, um, so that they were so busy messing about in the bus <laughs> that they didn't have time to be as mournful as they might well have been in such serious uh, circumstances. Everything they'd done from their first hit up till then had received everybody's praise. Magical Mystery Tour basically was the first false step where the, the public and all the critics could have a bit of a go at them. When it was shown on television in black and white on, at Christmas time that year, it didn't go down terribly well. The public were confused by it. The critics didn't like it. So it was like the first bad reviews the Beatles had ever really experienced. It was quite a bit of a blow for them. And uh, the Beatles were so worried, in fact, that they had it shown again in colour about two weeks later. But strange enough, the damage had been done. A lot of people said, well, it would never have happened with Brian Epstein. Uh, um, when Brian Epstein was alive, he wouldn't have allowed it because it was too obscure, it wasn't direct enough, etc., etc. They'd just thrown all these elements together, got in a bus and driven around and filmed what happened. And it never really came across as this happy magical mystery tour that it was supposed to be. It came across as, as a bit of a mess. People loved it. You know, the, the proper Beatle people loved it. It was just the, the, the critics at the time. But then, you know, the, the Beatles no longer had that protective wall of Brian around them. You know, they were, they were open for... It was open season on them by then. And, the, the, and the, the, they never quite recaptured that, um, that belief that the media had them had in them after that. Uh, they were pretty un uh, pretty unsinkable up until Mystery Tour and and I think they uh, the critics needed something to uh, needed to um, Give them a bit of their own. Considered that for six years I had been part of the greatest phenomenon of the, the show business world in working at such close quarters and within the inner circle of the Beatles. So of course, when that era came to an end, there was sadness about it, um, but I also recognised that I had been part of the whole Beatles situation, the Beatlemania situation, and that was no longer around. The era had gone. The Beatles were no longer the Fab Four. They were individual people. There was Paul McCartney, John Lennon, Ringo Starr, George Harrison, going out to do their separate things. Um, and therefore, there was no sadness in the fact that all that was over because that had done everything that it could do as a unit, as a a band. Um, it had been a memorable part of history, uh, but I was ready to move on just as much as they were. Okay, the, uh, while my guitar gently weeps starts in C minor, and then he keeps the C minor chord, but he puts uh, a B flat root on it, and then he keeps the C minor chord and he puts an A root on it, and then it actually changes to an A flat major seventh chord, and then he plays a C minor chord, a B flat major chord, an F major to a G major. And then he repeats the whole process. Except this time he goes C minor to B flat to E flat major to G major brings him to the chorus of C. So it's a beautifully constructed
piece of music. Yeah. I think the White Album might be the greatest rock album of all time. Not necessarily my favourite, but I, I can't think of anything else that has so many different styles, so much pizzazz, so much innovation, so much intelligence, so much fun, so much pain, so much pleasure, all across 30 songs, 90 minutes of music. Um, and okay, at the time George Martin said he wished that he could have compressed the record and made one great album out of it. But I think it actually works better as a sprawling monster of a record with 30 songs. Um, and often the ones that stick in the mind are the throwaways, they're the one minute songs. Why don't you do it in the road or Wild Honey Pie, stupid little things that shouldn't work, but which are still great fun to play 40 years later. Abbey Road is an unbelievable piece of work. I'm absolutely, probably close to their best piece of work they've ever, ever made. Everybody talks about the, 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 the great medley of songs on the second side, and it's entirely meaningless, and it's wonderful pop music. I mean, it is, it's the absolute um, high point of six, uh, 60s pop production, and ELO made an entire career out of trying to reproduce it through the 70s and 80s. Um, it's the last time when John and Paul actually worked together. I mean, John always was very sarcastic about that medley in retrospect. Um, if you go back to the newspaper cuttings, it reveals it was actually as much John's idea in the first place as it was Paul's. So he was, John was equally enthusiastic about it. And it suited him later when he was writing very personal songs to pretend that, oh no, I don't know, I was forced into doing that kind of thing. At the same time, you've got George Harrison's real emergence as a world-class songwriter. Um, Frank Sinatra said that Something was the greatest love song ever written. Now, after that, he always used to credit it to Lennon and McCartney, which was a bit of a shame, but um, you know, it was a nice thought. And it is one of, the great, one of the great ballads, I mean, by anybody, never mind a Beatle. And at the same time, George also wrote Here Comes the Sun on a day when he had a business meeting and he got really fed up and he'd gone back and sat in Eric Clapton's garden and got his acoustic guitar out and thought, I'm not going to get caught in all that Beatles nonsense. I'm just, you know, it's sunny, it's lovely. And an amazing song came out of it. I think by the time Abbey Road came out, um, the Beatles were really looking into sort of what they were going to do when they finished as a band. The end was in sight for the Beatles. And uh, so although I still wouldn't say they'd run out of steam as writers, um, perhaps it was becoming slightly evident that it was more of a chore, really. It was... Uh, Lesser, lesser kind of uh, inspiration. They left the best epitaph to a band they could ever leave. That was probably one of their best records ever and it was phenomenal. If you're looking at the times of recording, the final Beatles album was really Abbey Road, but Let It Be emerged after Abbey Road as the final release. Obviously that meant that uh, people considered that the Beatles' career ended with Let It Be and the band themselves weren't happy with that. The last thing which, you know, could have been you know, thank you, thanks very much everybody, you know, it's been fun but we're not going to do it anymore. It ended up being a really bitter and nasty divorce. It would have been far better in fact had Abbey Road been the final release Beatles album but uh, fate decreed that it wouldn't be. But even at the end the Beatles were still making great records and still producing thoughtful pieces of music, timeless pieces of music. And uh, it's quite a sad end to what, what was an absolutely fantastic career. You felt sorry for, the, for those poor kids who worked there and all those fans. You know, just like, what are they going to do? It, it was just a big sort of, hmm, what, a fan club, there's millions of them. You know, they're going to be so upset, <laughs> and of course they were. But it's uh, yeah, but that's what happens when people get divorced. You know, there's always people let down in the end. The whole point of Let It Be was it was supposed to be the Beatles live. 
Um, they were going to do a concert, then they didn't want to do a concert. That was too much effort, and they didn't like the fans anymore anyway, and they couldn't be asked. So they'd make a record pretending to be live, and that's why they went up onto the Apple roof and so on. But the concept got flawed as soon as they started overdubbing and adding things and so on. And then it got flawed even more when Phil Spector came in a year later and added orchestras and girl harmony choirs and so on to it. So what was supposed to be a live record of what the Beatles really did sound like, as John Lennon said, with our trousers down, got perverted as a concept. Now the other main problem with, with um, Let It Be is that John Lennon was on heroin at the time. Um, and so his creative input was virtually nil. If you listen back to the recording tapes for the sessions, the number of times you can hear Paul McCartney saying to John, have you got anything? Have you got anything to offer? And John just doesn't say anything. Yoko answers on his behalf. Or George will come up with a new song. I mean, George was coming in with a, a good new song almost every day at that point. And he'd play it to John, who'd just you'd go, oh, that's boring, and start playing an old 12-bar blues song instead. So when you've got the, the person who has been effectively the leader of the group saying, I don't care anymore, I'd, I'd rather take drugs than play music with you. It's very hard to get a, a, you know, a, a cohesive album out of that situation. I think the Beatles broke a mould that said that pop music is of its time, because uh, for, for Beatles fans and for pop fans, Beatles music is forever. They could rock with the best of them, but they could do a ballad as sweet as anybody. Even if they were playing rock and roll, it's very uh, balanced and tasteful. Um, that's the trick, I think, that they achieved, really. They gave a whole generation a meaning, and uh, they, they gave the, the whole music industry its start. The world needed something different, and they came around at the right time. So if you think about it in modern day context, how long does a band last? Two or three years? Well, the Beatles did a, a bit better than that and produced a, an incredible amount of music. What's the one? Most unusual request we've ever had from a Well, I wouldn't like to say. <laughs>